Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. In the last video we worked on improving the texture editor and we added buttons for channel selection. This can be used to view only one channel or a combination of channels from the texture. Although the buttons are working, we still need to generate a new image from the selected channels. In this video we are going to write a pixel shader and use it in a shader effect for WPF. This shader effect will render the image using only the selected channels. Previously, we made these buttons which we intend to use for selecting one or more color channels in the image. At this point, nothing happens when we change the selection. Therefore, we need to write some kind of image processing code that will display an image depending on which channels are selected by the user. One way of doing this is to read the pixels of the bitmap and create another bitmap image that only consists of the selected channels. This, however, is reasonably slow and also doesn't play nice with C Sharp's garbage collector. That means that we could end up with a lot of allocated memory, which can only be freed at the whims of the garbage collector. A better way of doing it is to render this image using a pixel shader, which we can attach to the image control in WPF using an effect. That's why it's called a shader effect. We have been using effects before. Drop shadow and blur effects are the ones that we have been using so far. However, we can also create our own effect, and for this particular use case, it's a shader effect. As you can see in this example in Microsoft's documentation, we can provide a pixel shader and give it any input that it needs through dependency properties. So let's go through this step by step. First, we need to add a class that inherits from shader effect. We can immediately use this class as an effect for the texture image. However, we have to pass the selected channels to the shader through a dependency property, which we can either hard code in XAML or bind to the channels property of the texture editor view model. In order to get a better idea of what the effect inputs should be, Let's write the pixel shader first. I'll add an HLSL file to the resource folder of the texture editor. We are going to compile this shader and provide its compiled shader object, or its bytecode, as the resource for our shader effect, as we'll see later in this video. The first input is the image itself. This is the image we see right now when we open a texture asset. We can sample a pixel from this image using a 2D sampler. Next is an array of floating point values. As far as I know, we can't pass booleans to our shader, so I just use floats. For each channel, if the value is non-zero, that means that the channel is set and should be displayed. In order to be able to handle images with different RGBA formats, we need to provide the stride, or how many bytes per pixel the image format has. This is given in another 4D vector. The main pixel shader function has the UV coordinate of the pixel as its function parameter and it will return a color. After getting the stride and sampling the pixel color from the input image, we can check which channels are set and handle each case accordingly. The first and simplest case is when all channels are selected or the stride is 1, which means that the image is already grayscale and there is only one channel to select from. In this case, we just return the pixel color as is. The second simple case is when only the alpha channel is selected. Then we only return the value of the alpha channel as a grayscale RGB value. For any other channel combination, if the stride is 16, 4 or 3, we return a color that depends on the selected channels. So we have 4 channels and the number of combinations is 4 factorial minus 2 that we already have here, which makes for 22 cases. 
Those of you who have been watching this series for some time already know that I prefer to be lazy, so I'm not going to write 22 if statements here. And fortunately we don't have to, since this can be done entirely without branching. First we'll invert the RGB channel selection. So any channel that was selected is unselected and vice versa. Next we turn off the unselected RGB channels in the sampled pixel. Then for each channel we either take the pixel value of that channel if it was selected, or the pixel value of any other channel that was selected. We then return the R, G and B values with an alpha depending on whether the format has alpha and the alpha channel was selected. If none of these cases were hit, we return the ugly magenta color as a way of telling us that something went wrong. Now we are going to use the FX compiler to compile the shader using these command line parameters. WPF supports shader model 3, so that's the profile we'll be using. You can look for the FX compiler in program files, Windows Kit 10 or 11 if you have Windows 11, or any higher number if you are watching this video 5 years from now. In which case I wonder what you're doing here since AI will have taken over all creative processes and has made game engines obsolete. But anyway, we can search for FXC and since Microsoft likes to use your hard drive for dumping useless stuff that you don't need, you are likely to find multiple copies of FXC.exe. Okay, this one is for x64. I'll copy this to where the pixel shader is and use the command line to compile it. Looks like I made a typo in the shader code on line 1. You know these memes that you see sometimes and you think that can't happen to me? Well, it happened to me just now. Apparently we can't have an empty line at the start of the shader code for some reason. In4 is with a capital I and stride is missing an E. Ok, now it compiled successfully and we can see that a CSO file was added here. Make sure to set it as a resource in the properties panel and build the project. We need a helper function to get the path to this new resource and give it to the shader effect, but first let me see if any of these Visual Studio suggestions are any good. This one uses the range operator, which is fine. This one uses pattern matching, also fine. I'll ignore this one for now. Now this one's actually interesting. It uses a tuple to swap values, which eliminates the use of a temporary variable. Ok, that's all of them. Now I need a function that returns the URI of a resource given its relative path and its type. It's just a thing that we have been typing in our XAML code all the time, but now it generates the path programmatically. In the channel select effect, we need a private static instance of the pixel shader, which is created using the path to its bytecode. The input image is registered as a pixel shader sampler property, which is also a dependency property, so it's defined in the same way. 
Also note that this integer parameter should correspond to the register number we used in the pixel shader. The next dependency property is the set of four floating point values which indicate channel selection. For some reason, we can't use a vector 4D type as an input to the pixel shader. The only type that I managed to get working is a color type which has four floating point RGBA values. The data is passed to the shader in a constant buffer at register number 0. The last property is the stride, which is a single floating point value and passed in the constant buffer at register 1. In the constructor, we set the pixel shader, which is an inherited property, and update the input to the shader. In the XAML code, now we can see that we have new properties that we can bind to. So the next step is to add channels and stride properties to Texture Editor's view model. Hmm. What does this red channel do here? Well, let me move it up then. So it's red, green, blue, and alpha. Good. Now for the channels, we set the floating point value to 1 if the channel is selected and 0 if it's not. The stride value is the image's bits per pixel divided by 8 because we used bytes per pixel in our shader. We could have used bits as well, it's just a matter of preference. I don't think that there would be a pixel shader invocation if the selected slice bitmap is null, but just to handle the case when someone asks for the stride value, we return 1 if there is no selected bitmap. Now we can bind to these new properties. The last thing that we need to do to get this working is to notify the UI when something happens that has a consequence for channels and stride. Obviously selecting or unselecting a channel should issue an update. Also setting a new texture and changing any of the image indices should update both channels and stride properties. In this function, we raise a property changed event for both channels and stride properties. We also raise these events when all channels are selected at once. This is the reason we used the backing fields here instead of the properties. I wanted to avoid raising channel and stride property changed events four times, which is unnecessary. We want to notify the UI as well when the bitmap is regenerated. Oh, by the way, I forgot to turn on all channels by default, so let me do that first before we try this out. Okay, now I can select a channel and we can see what the grayscale value is of that channel. What we see here also makes sense. Pay attention to the lips, which are red, and therefore brighter when the red channel is selected, and almost black when the green or blue channels are selected. We can also select any combination of channels. One thing to keep in mind is that using this shader effect could increase the GPU usage of the application. 
It's kind of difficult to see the difference now because I'm recording this video, which also uses GPU encoding, but we can try anyway. So GPU utilization is at 85% with the shader effect on. and it's still 85% without it. Oh well, I'm not sure. You'll have to check to see if it's different for you. Next I'd like to test the texture with transparency. Here we see an image with three circles in red, green and blue, which has a transparent background. It's nice to see that channel selection only shows the pixels from the selected channels. And we also see that the alpha channel only shows the opaque pixels. Also note that the selection persists when we select a different MIP level. Let's test normal maps next. Here we can see that it was successfully recognized and imported as a normal map and therefore this button is now visible and selected. However, we can also display the image as if it wasn't a normal map and also select different channels. This is a regular bitmap without transparency. And this one is a single channel grayscale image, but we see that the pixel shader returns the error color when we try to select a channel, which is not what it's supposed to do. So I might have made a typo somewhere in the shader code. I'll have a look at that in a minute. Let's view all normal maps and check if they were all recognized as such, which appears to be the case. Ok, let's look at our shader code. Aha, I see I messed up this first condition. It should succeed if all channels are selected or the stride value is 1, which was the case for that failing texture. Now I have to go and find the FX compiler again in order to recompile the shader. And as always, I made a typo again. Stride is with lowercase s. And we have a new compiled shader. Now when we select a different channel on a single channel image, nothing happens. You could also choose to hide the channel buttons if the image is grayscale. Let me remove the FX compiler again, and with that we have come to the end of this video. This wasn't exactly game engine programming, but I thought it was a neat trick to know when doing imaging stuff in WPF. I hope you found it useful as well and enjoyed the video. As always, thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time, until then take care and happy game engineering!